Hey, how you doing? This is Charlie. And Athena. Hey, we're here to uh, talk to you about our podcast. Yeah, we are the Raise Up podcast hosts and we are doing another Q&A session. Two of them. <laughs> well, this will be our second Q&A session, yes. yes. So if you guys want a question answered, we need you to go to raiseupmindset.com and submit a question on the website or you can post something on our YouTube comments. On Facebook, on whatever. Yep, yeah. yep. All of them, Instagram. So today's question what is going to be around scaling your business. So I want to scale my business. What are the steps I should consider? There are so many different steps in scaling your business. So um, you have to have the business to scale it first. So you have to look in what your business model is. and Is there opportunity for you to gain more business? Yeah. I mean, and then is the business there? Is it, do you buy another vehicle? Do you buy another uh, iPad? Do you buy another... Uh, do you get an office? Do you get a bigger office? Do you get a warehouse? I mean, all that stuff is just so many different things. So, I mean, you got to admit when we first started, uh, we had two six passenger limousines and a little 20 passenger, what we call the party bus, but it was just a little shuttle it's bus. Tick, that, tick. Yeah. So we basically had a, a bus that ticked from the day that we bought it until it didn't have like a sticky lifter, but we never screwed with it because we didn't have it worked mechanic, great. It worked great. It worked great for like 10, 15 years, but we made it into a little party bus. So once we got that, or I'll talk about our experiences, how we scaled, um, we immediately figured out the six passenger limousines were too small. Like we thought groups and parties would like to be in a smaller atmosphere. And right away they said, the biggest you have is a six passenger. And 10 was really the biggest back then. A 10 passenger mm -hmm. Tiffany limo is what we ended up buying next. So shortly after we had this six passenger limousines, we were getting people, but they wanted bigger limos. And we realized right away that we had to get something bigger. So smaller ones work out for smaller groups, couples, two couples, things like that perfectly. Six passenger doesn't mean it fits six passengers. <laughs> it matters on your size. Yeah. So we immediately figured out that we needed a bigger limo. And the party bus worked out pretty well because that's how we used to go out. I mean, we used to run out uh, buses from friends and we'd go out and we'd be able to drink alcohol and get taken from place to place. And I remember even doing it back in the day in school buses. I mean, that's yeah. how long go you used to be able to run a school bus and go out and it was kind of corny because school buses sucked but it was like it was you know what's so fun about it it's like you felt like you're in high school and you're drinking alcohol in the back of the school bus and you're like this is kind of cool because you know like in school buses we could never do that back in the day so um so you know, what i think you're saying is is that um is there a demand from your customer base yeah so Are we they, saw the demand that's yeah. what i was kind of getting to it's like somebody said hey we need a bigger group so then we immediately look for, for a 10 passenger so how to scale that was your customer base, your people that were talking to you saying that what you had really wasn't working. So we had to re kind of invent the wheel. So, and, and I think that that's probably one of the foundations of growing your business is what do your customers want? Because sometimes we think we know what our customers want and we're completely off base because we think it's what we want, but we're not our customers sometimes. Yeah. You know, and it, I think as you get into business longer, you figure out what your customer base is. Are you leisure? Are you are you business? Are you what are you doing? I mean, what are you, are you corporate? What, what what's your business model? And so, you know, we went from a leisure business uh, model. I, I shouldn't say leisure business. It's more like a for? retail. A retail. See, that's what I was looking for. I'm sorry. We were completely retail in the very beginning. I mean, we were totally retail, and then we realized there's only so much retail business here, and then we went into a corporate model yeah and the corporate model really is where we at sit at now so we do some leisure stuff too but most of everything we have is corporate and it's uh you have that nuts and bolts of your business always knowing that you're going to get that business and going in there and you know when we were scaling up vehicles and what we were buying and you know going from used vehicles to buying brand new vehicles you know we were a secondary market for quite some time that we bought somebody else's you know 80,000 mile vehicle because you know at the time it was easier for us to purchase those than it was to buy brand new so the, the scalable part is like do we want to buy somebody else's headaches or why are they getting rid of these vehicles at 80,000 right. miles or do we want to do that so when like we had a great deal that we bought 13 SUVs from a company and we ended up having a couple of blown motors a couple of transmissions went out quite a way so we were end up always constantly doing the repairs but they looked really good they were fancy and here we don't put as near my, as many miles as they do in the lower 48 on these vehicles yeah you know? we're not going um between states and yeah so we stay within state and we stay in a smaller distance area so in the very beginning it really made sense for us to buy those because we could end up buying 12 or 13 of them and writing a check for them and yeah. Now we buy five or six and we try to buy five or six new vehicles every year to constantly change out our fleet. So we don't have anything that's older than, 
you know, five or six years old, you yeah. know, especially in the crew transportation business. So Well, and that's more of a maintenance level. I, I would say something that I saw you paying really close attention to, besides what the customer demand was, is um, you, really watching the cash flow. You, you have to be able to balance your working capital with what you're trying to um, scale up to. So we understood that the business was there, but we couldn't go out and just buy 10, 10 passenger limos. Like we had to gradually, because of our cash flow at that season of sure. our life, I mean, in our business. And so it's like, there's some people that think, oh, well, I, I know the business is there. I'm gonna go buy 10 limos, I'm, or I'm gonna go buy 10 of these, and I'm Motor gonna crisis. put them on credit. Yeah. And, um, and so that's another piece uh, to, to consider is, going that route and leveraging yourself like what makes sense for you you know and and, and so many people in our industry <clears throat> on this last pandemic that we had with covid they had leveraged yourself so much like the business was there the work model was there but they <clears throat> they kind of let their customer dictate what they had to have and what they did so we went out and bought so many motor coaches we bought these five or six hundred thousand dollar vehicles or payments are twelve fourteen thousand a month and they leverage yourself to the hilt and all of a sudden we have this pandemic and so many people had they they were like upside down all of a sudden you know they were almost they didn't have two three four months in reserve they were running month to month but they had a good cash flow and the business was there but you have to look at it and say geez if something stopped tomorrow what would we be at and we've been in a very good position we own everything outright I and mean, we we kind of put ourselves in that position a long time ago it's like <clears throat> we never want to get ourselves financially strapped to somebody that we owed so much that we could take away our houses or whatever else that we had going on. We really figured that this is how our business model had to be. And, um, and it doesn't mean it's the same now. I mean, we are doing the same thing now, but now we look at it as like, how can we leverage some of our credit? How can we leverage some of our money now to make it more sense to make more money on it? Especially when interest rates are so much higher and things like this. But when interest rates are a little bit lower, then we looked at doing a little financing in homes and yeah. things like that. Now we've bought in a few homes, we've cashed them out and did some because the interest rates are so high. So you have to, when you're leveraging yourself or you're you're considering in, your debt load. Your debt load would be a good way to do it. You really have to see is what do you have coming in, what do you have going out, and what can you weather? And, um, and what what's in the reserves? Because the responsibility that you have to your employees and to your vendors and- Your bankers. Yeah, and, yeah, the, and right. the bankers, absolutely. And, and your banking relationship is a really key place, I would say, in um, establishing your business because we keep a line of credit if we need to use it. So for instance, there could be an amazing opportunity that comes up that um, we know we, we are looking at this short term situation. That would be an area where we would use that line for something like that. Or if you have a new contract that's coming on, that's gonna require a lot of upfront loading, um, loading that you have two or three years in payroll. Yeah. I mean, a lot of our contracts are two or three months out on payments where they are, and it takes 30 days, takes 30 days for a process, and you get 15 days of pay. So it's a it's a 45 to 65 day out uh, process. And when you're carrying, you know, two or $300,000 per month on it, that could be a little bit weighing on you. So you have all that payroll, you have the vehicles, you have the new expenses of iPads, you have the new expenses of all the things you have to do, right? extra sets of tires. I mean, all the things you have to do. So it, we're pretty intentional about when we look at this and we buy new vehicles. And then of course you come into the time that it's time to pay taxes and all this other stuff. Do you need to buy more vehicles or do you want to pay this out in the taxes part? So there's so many elements in what you have that you have to look at all these things and say, am I doing the right thing with our money? Yes. And I would say that not thinking that you know everything about or or you know what's best like there are resources Be fun, friends, friends your accountant. <laughs> there are resources that um, are available for free even online that you could do some research on and just get some more information around but i would absolutely say that if you have a clear understanding of what your expenses are that's got to be the key you have to know what money is going out and you have to know what money is going in to have a baseline to understand if you're even in a position where you're gonna to scale to the next level. You know, I said on the airplane, um, the gentleman that runs all the Costco gas stations and all the Costco car washes. And uh, very interesting guy, I can't remember his name, he's a great guy, he gave me his card and um, somehow I've misplaced it somewhere. But you know, 
I, I talked to him, I said, you know, when you guys go into a business project, you know, what do you look at as, you know, when are you gonna start being able to make money? And he goes, Charlie, we never enter a business idea until we're gonna make day, money on day one. You know, my eyes just got huge, you know, I'm like, day one, you know, that's great. I mean, what a great concept. They look into a marketing program and where they're at, and they go into it knowing that they're gonna make money on the first day. They don't look at it as a lot, one year loser, or six months, or whatever else it is. That place needs to be able to make a profit on the first day. And I thought, wow. I mean, and you know, as, as leaders, you know, understand that we have all the capital investments that when we're first starting out, you know, we just bought four Sprinter vans. It was $325,000, you know, that is a chunk of cash. You know, yeah. that's over a quarter million dollars. It's, it's, it's almost one third of a million dollars. So when you look at that, um, that is it. When they're putting their capital investment on, doesn't mean they're going to pay off their stuff in day one, but the business model is they have to make money on day one. So when they open that gas station, it's got to start turning a profit every single day. So whatever their capital expenses are, whatever their what are the, their payroll was, their payrolls, day, everything, their, their, their cost business, the cost sold. of business, everything, they're going to make money on the first day. And I thought, wow. And it always goes back to my Bucky's now because I always look at Bucky's as such a great business plan. I mean, those places do so well. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at your business plan and where it is, kind of have some insights. We always have these gut feelings like, oh, I can't wait to get this bus, or I really want to buy this, or this limo is such a smoking deal. Or I deal. want to get this bigger warehouse. Yeah, you know, we've had lots of friends, and you've seen like our friend John Schwartz that was on here, you know, he wanted to, he could expand his business. I said, go in your garage now, right now, and tell me how many, how many vehicles you have in your garage. He goes, three, and I'm like, how many are you holding? He goes, 12. I'm like, do you think you need to expand? He goes, no. Sometimes we have to talk that out through somebody else to mm -hmm. be able to expand. If do we want to expand, just because it's a deal doesn't mean it's the deal. It's got to be your deal, yeah. and there's always a deal out there, guys. There's always somebody that's gonna that's gonna have a sprinter for sale. It's gonna have a motor. This is for never sale. gonna come about again. Yeah, and you just have to realize that if it, it's it, it is a deal for somebody, but it just not might not be for you. And yeah. if you're just sitting onto it to hold it, then does it really make sense? And you know, I was that guy. I mean, I would hold on to things forever. I mean, you know, when we moved over to this new property that we have now. I had to unload a ton of stuff. And at the end of it, I'm like, I don't care what it goes for. Just get it out of here. We have no space for it. But for years, I held on to it because I thought, well, we're going to be able to use that bus or something's going to come up where we need it and stuff like this. And we just realized that after two or three years of it sitting there, we just lost all that money that they were actually the equity, worth. Yeah. The equity was inside of them. They just went down. So your depreciating assets are always depreciating. And it doesn't mean they're going to start coming into money all of a sudden. The only time that we ever saw that was really during COVID when there wasn't a production of vehicles. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, used vehicle prices went up because you couldn't buy new vehicles and that was like your one and done you had that chance you know like two percent financing that's that's gone you know yeah. that's that's going to come back so when you're scaling your businesses look at all those different things and if you don't know ask somebody and if you don't have a good accountant ask them they're going to be able to tell you numbers numbers don't lie and you know that brings me to a point when i'm choosing vendors for my organization whether it's a cpa or a bookkeeper or an attorney or any of that I make sure that those people have the heart of a teacher because I don't sign things that I don't understand. And if they can't explain it to me and have the patience to explain it to me while I'm on this journey, then they're not for me. And I'll tell you, like, we have just met some incredible people who are just like, yeah, just let me break this down for you really quick. And I, I would absolutely encourage anybody who is looking like, hey, I think I need a bookkeeper now because it's getting a little bit overwhelming and I really don't like to do invoicing and, and accounts payable. Uh, that's what you're looking for is somebody who, can, who has the patience and, and is competent in their field of business to just give you some one-liners or some details and strategize a little bit with you. You know, time is money. And when we're not very good at something, we take a lot of extra time to do that. And if we're taking that extra time, could we be making money doing that and actually hire somebody that's going to do it five times as better than we are, quicker, and, five times as faster. and then you're going to be able to make up for the money for that and probably build some on top of that. And so we get in this mindset that we have to do it all. Yeah. And like, I had an employee call me the other day and said, hey, Charlie, there's something on my paycheck I don't understand. I'm like... So you're calling me because you don't understand your paycheck. I mean, it's like, you think I do? I mean, we have accountants. I don't know. I, if you have an added or additional line on your check, I'm not the person to ask that question to because there would be no way I would do payroll, you know? But <laughs> it's so funny that, they, they, but he's like, you're the owner though. I'm like, well, yeah, I am the owner, but we, we source that out. I mean, that's we definitely talked to. Yeah. professionals that understand rules and regulations that are in their line 
that um, keep us keep us where we need to be. And that's why we have compliance people. That's why you have people that do your DOTs. That's why you have people that do this stuff for you is to keep you in compliance because when you realize you want to scale up, you can't be that all person. You can't Mm-mm. you can't do it all. I mean, you can, but you're going to drive yourself crazy and you're not going to do it very efficiently. And you're going to you're going to reach burnout. You're going to be Or you're going to make a big mistake and all of a sudden you're going to owe a bunch of money and it's just like, you know, and then you're going to want to claim, "Well, you know, I I'm just doing this all on my own." Be smart about it. it. Really be smart about it and talk to people in your industry and say, hey, you know, who are you using? You know, who is good in our industry? Yes. Like we have a lot of great people in our industry in the transportation industry that have already figured out how to spin that wheel. We don't need to figure out how to spin that wheel yeah. now because it's already been spin and you can find somebody's. I mean, like Robin, using Robin, I mean, that girl's just a rocket scientist. I mean, she's got us help. She's got us all this other stuff. She's helping with some she's of our projects. She's been a project. great resource, absolutely. Yeah, and there's, and there's people that we go to these events that at first you're thinking, oh, they're a little woo-woo and everything like that. But when you really look at it, they're like, wow, these people really got their shit together. I mean, we really need to be on this team with them and then yeah. they want to team up with you because what their business is is looking for businesses like ours and especially businesses businesses are growing they want to be part of that growth you know yeah that because that's just growing them and then we're pushing work to them you know because we're seeing all the great things that are happening through that so your partnership that's the other thing is you have to have great partnership to upscale your business if you don't have partnerships and you're doing a lone ranger it's not going to work you're only going to be able to get so high and you think about when you're doing it all yourself like there's this level where you are doing a lot of it yourself but then you're at this pace where it's like something's going to break if you don't start like you you haven't got days off and it's one thing to know that hey we're in a busy season and this busy season is going to end on september 15th there's an expiration date (laughs) yeah but it's another thing when you just think that you're going to keep rolling and rolling and rolling and um and you don't have a plan to get some reprieve and you know we've I think as you see as business owners, we've all been in that kind of there. It's like, you know, we're burning the candle at both ends and at the end of the candle, there's nothing left, you know, and that's where you have to be. So if it's nothing left for yourself, there's nothing left for your spouse, your kids, something's going to break. Yeah. And usually it's usually your family, your relationships, whatever else it might be. And then it can be your business, your employees, you know, I mean, if you start treating your employees bad, then you have no business. So, I mean... There's so many factors about building your business. And then your finances, your capital. How is that? How's your credit? Um, yeah. You know, do you want to leverage yourself? Do you want to do you want to be a personal guarantee on everything? You know, now you have houses involved. You have other people's houses involved. We had friends that were using their parents, their their in-laws' parents' credit on top of that to be able to finance some of the stuff they were doing. And then really? when this pandemic came up, like their, their in-laws' houses were in danger. I mean, there was like some crazy shit that was going on that made sense at the time because all this stuff was flowing in, but does it really make sense? And what is your profitability on it? Are you are you doing all this to get a 5% margin on your profit? Because maybe there's a better way to make that margin somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, So That comes back to knowing what your expenses are and knowing what your income is. So if you, at the end of it, you have your income and then you have all the expenses, underneath is your profit. And if that ends up being well, you gotta go in the negative. That. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of people work on the negative. It's so crazy. When you look at their books, you're like, he's like, I'm a $4 million company. I'm like, yeah, but you spent five. How are you a $4 million company? You're in minus $1 million company. Oh no, I have cash flow coming every month. But you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're, yep. you're, you're taking that money that is already owed to everybody else and you're 90 days out with them. Well, I mean, you are in a negative cash flow. You're going to go out of business. You're just, you're not, you're working for a job. You're not working a business. You're, you have a job and your job is declining. So. And when you're not using a software system to keep track of your expenses and you're, if you're just running your business out of your checking account and you see that you've got money in your checking account. (laughs) And so you think that you're good and you've got cash flow coming in like that doesn't work. No, no. X does not equal Z, you know, I mean, X and Y doesn't equal Z. You have to make sure that you're profitable. And, and, and some things, it takes a little bit of time, but you have to have some reverters to be able to make that happen. Yeah. And taking on some of the newer contracts that we've taken on, I mean, it, it was another 12 vehicles. It was this, it was this, but it was a guarantee for three years. And we can forecast what that was going to print in and what the vehicles are going to cost us per month and what the employees are going to cost. And you have to be able to do those forecasts and you just can't pull that number out, yeah. out of it. And you can't be the lowest bidder. I mean, the lowest bidder runs the lowest price and it's zero. I mean, you don't want to run 
into yourself that you're in a negative deficit. I mean, you have to make sense. And if it's not your client, if it's not your customer, then you have to let them know, I'm sorry, this number doesn't work. And we've had to lose some contracts because of, of, of $2 and 37 cents. I mean, no, it was a, number's not working. the number doesn't work. And uh, you know, and they usually eventually come back because they go to this person that comes down super low and all of a sudden they're like, well, we don't, our vehicle's broke. We don't have nothing to buy of you new vehicles. Well, you didn't, you didn't put those in your expenditures. You didn't put that in your forecast. How do you not, how do you take a vehicle that's 237,000 miles and think you're gonna get another two years out of it? It's yeah. just not gonna happen. Yeah, it, it, it's absolutely true. The forecasting tool is something that we use on, on our bid practices. And you know, even when we're doing uh, contract negotiations, I remember one particular contract where they wanted to change the pay structure. And when I used the, when I forecasted what this was gonna look like, the uh, I was ecstatic because it, it meant that we were going to make way more money than we were making on that contract and the client was insisting that we move to this model and at first glance it didn't look like that was going to be a benefit to us and then like after you and i went through the numbers i was like holy cow like this is we're absolutely doing this immediately and you, you were know, like wow it, it was the business plan they wanted to come up with and yeah it was, it was a little bit different for us to do with this because we are, had already done this contract for three or four years a different way mm -hmm. and it had a guarantee and the guarantee is always there so it's like your cell phone plan <clears throat> you know you're paying 90 dollars a month unlimited everything but unlimited everything doesn't really work anymore because they throttle you down. So like if you use so much internet, they're gonna say, well, we're gonna still give you unlimited internet, but it's only gonna be at half the speed. So when you look at things like this, you really wanna look at the whole picture. And when yes. they came to us with a new business plan, we had to have a really open mind to say, yeah, we're not gonna make near as much money on this beginning, but if this grows, this is where it's gonna be at, and this is where we're at. And we're not waffling back and forth now, we're not gonna go back to this other business model, because right. if it does, it's gonna be way higher than it was before. So sometimes your customer will have a great idea, then you won't think it's so great. Do the math, do the numbers, because it might end up in your favor. In the long run, they wanna know what their guarantee is. If they're guaranteeing to put 20 people out there, they wanna know that this is gonna be the rate and that's all it's gonna be. So sometimes their math doesn't make sense to us, but it's okay, it's, it doesn't have to. As long as our math works, that's all yes, we care about. Yes, as long as our profitability <laughs> percentage works, then that's what we, we're focused on running our own game. We're not trying to run their business for them. And um, that and we get something. in the habits of sometimes trying to do that. Like, like oh, you're wrong in this. And we're like, hey, you know, it's okay. If they wanna be wrong and they wanna pay yeah, us, that's okay. Yeah. I mean, and if their business model makes sense to do it this way and they're doing it everywhere this way, we're okay with it. I mean, yeah. as long as you're hitting your benchmark number, and you know, um, right now we have another, um, our last kid is, has got his driver's permit. And I told him rule number one in driving is mind your own business. And he was like, what do you mean mom, mind your own business? I'm like, when someone's speeding past you, like you just focus on what you need to do. You don't worry about what that other car is doing whether they're going too slow or too fast, you just maneuver your vehicle around to wherever you need to be. And when somebody is um, doing something foolish, like you don't need to try to figure out why they're acting that way. Um, just continue on your path and focus on what you need to do, keeping your speed limit appropriate, making sure that your surroundings are safe and that you, you're you positioned correctly. Yeah, don't do like dad. Don't try to overthink it. I'm always watching everybody and I'm always second guessing what people are doing, but I'm anticipating that something's gonna go differently for me because I always usually have bad customers or I'm driving people or family. So I'm always the uh, one that scans the room right when I first walk in the door and look at all my danger points. I always wanna well, know in the, in the car. That's, that's okay for you. Yeah. But for him as well, a new, new person, yeah. I want him to focus on running his own game. My daughter wanted to figure out where game. the horn worked, had the horn work right away when she got in the car. She went to honk the horn at everybody. <laughs> yes, yes. Audra's got 50% of me and 50% of him. But really, I think that when we decide that we're going to mind our own business about things, I'm not talking about turning a blind eye when somebody needs help. I mean, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, there are some people that absolutely we can lift up and, and offer a service to, and it's not a sacrifice to us. It's, it's actually in, it's coming from a place of love. But in most cases, when I'm thinking about business, like I'm running my own game. I'm not focused in on um, chasing after the competition or what could be perceived as competition. I'm, I'm not running a SWOT analysis on anybody that's in transportation in my region. I'm running my own game and doing what I need to do and listening to customers, 
internal and external customers, our employees or, or the people that are paying us to do a service. And so um, those are other areas too where you can absolutely get distracted from all these other balls around you if you're, if you're just, if you're just, will just stay in your lane and run your own game. You know, and it's okay to partner with those people on some of the things too, because you can actually learn some good insights and some other things from them, and you might be able to take over some stuff from them too. As long as it's meeting your criteria, you're not losing money, you're making money, and you're making a profitability. Um, and then you're actually can pick up some extra work from them too. Yeah. So, I mean, we try to partner with all these different ones that agencies and people that we work with that are in our field too. But if it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. Yes, hmm. yes, and getting clarity around what makes sense. There's so many opportunities that you, that everyone has these days. There's coaches out there, there's business advisors, and um, I mean, we help like all kinds of people. Yeah, help Sylvia, get I got clarity. your phone call. Sylvia just called me a few minutes ago, and I, and she, I had to, I had to, I had to put her on uh, on um, on uh, standby there. So, uh, Sylvia, I'm sorry, but uh, we were in the middle of our podcast, so I didn't answer your call. <laughs> but uh, there's just there's a plethora of assistance these days. You guys don't need to stay on an island if you're on an island, and you can start to research, get get around a team. Whether that team looks like your CPA, your bookkeeper, your insurance broker, your banker, or or Just it's people your in business your industry coach, too, your or bu- or your peers. Yeah, absolutely. Good peers, ones that are running a good, clean business that have been around for a while that you can trust that are going to give you good advice. Yeah, I think that you will absolutely reap what you sow. So. You know, there's a lot of people that we reach out and talk to, and there's other business owners. I think we've talked about in other podcasts that we bounce ideas off of because. I can't go to my employee and ask them about a $4 million question or should we take this contract or not because they they just don't have that comprehension. They don't because... have the viewpoint from that far away because yeah. they don't know all the details. It's not that they're not smart or that they couldn't get to that place. It's that they don't have the ability to, to know all of the details. And so you just reach out to another person that's like-minded like yourself and that has a good successful business. and. You kind of bounce ideas off. Hey, is this a really good idea? You know, is this a person? Do you know a person? And shoot, sometimes they'll they'll have a better person than you had in the very beginning. I said, hey, you don't want to talk to this person. Talk so we were talking to one of our person. friends, Matt, yeah, and we were talking yeah. about windows, and he's like, I got this window guy, and we're like, what? Somebody builds these windows in town, and all of a sudden we're now buying windows, buying windows from him because we can get them locally done in town twice as bus, twice as fast, three times as fast, and and just a little bit different in price. Yeah. So it makes sense. So how to scale your business. There's so many different ways and we could talk about this a little bit more if you have some more questions about it. You or can definitely some ask specific us. questions that you have, <clears throat> like if you gave us a scenario on uh, what particular type of business you're, you're in and some details, then we'd, we'd love to help break that down for you. You know, and a lot of people that are in their business and successful don't mind helping other people that really, that value your time. And I have to say that part is like, if they don't value your time and they just want to hear what they want to hear, I'm probably not the person you want to uh, you want to call. But if you want to hear an honest opinion, and it might be the same opinion you have, that's great. Yeah. But if we're telling you something that we think is differently and you just discard it, then hey, you know, nothing venture, nothing gain. But I'm not going to keep answering those questions. It's it's you have to want to invest. If we want to invest our time, we want to invest it to somebody that really wants it. So. And it's open and who is able to receive that feedback loop because we're not doing it because we're not we're not sharing we're not our opinions yeah. because we don't have anything to do. Like it's it, it really takes time. We choose that to. Happen. It's intentionality. Yeah. Yes. So thank you again. Hey, if you like this cast, uh, again, this is stuff that we're just trying to help other people with and uh, if you like it, share it. Uh, it's pretty cool when you share these posts because we get people that say, geez, Joe, I didn't know you guys had a podcast and I was on somebody else's page and I saw them on their page and that's just so awesome. I'm on your 10th episode so far and you know we're way up that we're close to the 30s now. So we want to make sure that we're giving out great information. And if you guys have some questions, ask us. Yeah, and just pass the encouragement along. Like we're all in this together. Yeah. Uh, our, our, our band of entrepreneur peeps. So all the way from Anchorage, Alaska. Yeah. So check us out on raiseupmindset.com. Share our stuff, like our YouTube page. Facebook, Instagram. We're on Instagram, Instagram, Facebook, yep. So see you next time. Bye.
Thanks again for joining us on the Raise Up podcast. You can find us at raiseupmindset.com. Our socials link there so you can get anything that you need from Instagram, Facebook, our shorts. You can download the podcast straight from the website. If you're listening on another platform, please like, subscribe, share. We're just getting the word out on really the encouragement and um, propelling the entrepreneurial movement in our communities. Thanks again for listening. We've got something special at the end of our episodes now where it's called the Raise Up Response. This is just a sheet that if you want to dive deeper, it's got questions, it's got takeaways from the podcast. Click the link below and you can request it. It'll take you to our website and find it in your inbox. Thanks again. Bye-bye.